Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. The word cinematic comes up pretty often when discussing the visual traits of certain lenses. But what do we mean when we say an image is cinematic? The right visual tone can vary from movie to movie or even from scene to scene, and the DP's definition of cinematic might not be the same as the director's. So how do we describe what we want our cinematic images to look like without an agreed upon definition of what cinematic really means? This week I'm talking with Art Adams, Cinema Lens Specialist at Aerie, because he's uniquely suited to answer that question. Art's job at Aerie is to translate the characteristics of lens design from the language of engineering to the language of cinema. Art Adams, welcome to the Lens Journals Podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to start by embarrassing myself a little bit. Um, I had a meeting uh, earlier today about this podcast, and I brought this question up and tried to get an answer. And everybody just said, just ask him. It won't be embarrassing. So I, I feel a little weird about it, but I'm going to start here. Ari or Ari? Oh, wow. OK. Do you get that a lot? Uh, yeah. You know, in the in the U.S., <laughs> and, well, in the Americas, it's Ari in in. Germany, I think they actually say Ari because it's short for Arnold and Richter. But in the Americas, it's always been Ari. I've always known it to be Ari. And if somebody says Ari, I look at them and say, oh, we, we have to fix that. Oh, perfect. All right. I will proceed with Ari then. Yeah, please proceed with Ari. If we do this in Munich sometime, <laughs> then we might have to change, but I think we're good. So your job title at Ari is Cinema Lens Specialist. What does that entail exactly? What are your day-to-day responsibilities? Ah, that's a good question. Um, it's interesting because when I joined the company about two years ago, there was only one other specialist. And there's only two specialists in Area Americas, and we're both industry veterans. Uh, the other one deals with stabilized heads, and he's a, a camera operator. And I was a freelance DP for... 27 years. And then I was a camera assistant before that. So it, it's interesting that the specialists actually have a lot of industry experience. Technically, I'm in sales, but I, I always tell people I'm not a really great salesman. I need to have a good product. I can't, it, it's hard. I can't just sell anything. I have to sell things I believe in. So it's, it's kind of a good thing that I ended up at Airy. The other part of that is I, I can't really make you want something that's an aesthetic product. I can't make you appreciate something that I pre- appreciate artistically or that I, I think you should appreciate artistically. What I can do though, is I can show you what I see and then maybe you'll see it too. It's, I describe it as if uh, I wanted to sell you a Rothko and you didn't naturally appreciate Rothko. You know, you drew a lot of shapes and different colors and different proportions. And if you kind of understand something about the artist and what he was trying to do, then you can appreciate his work. But if you just go into it blind, you may get it, you may not. So I feel like I teach people art appreciation. You know, if I want to sell you a Rothko, I'm going to teach you how I look at a Rothko and how I appreciate it. And then maybe you appreciate it as well. And I approach lenses and cameras the same way. There are things I see in our lenses on our cameras that I really, really like. And I like to drill into those things to a really deep level because I've never been the kind of person who just says, oh, that looks pretty. I want to understand why it looks pretty because if I create something that I really like as a cinematographer, I'm worried that I'll never be able to create that again. And that's really frustrating. So I want to make sure I understand why it is that I like something. And I've always been that way. So with film stocks initially, and then with digital cameras, when I saw a camera with a look that I liked, I really tried to break it down. And when I saw a lens with a look I liked, I tried to figure out what, what is it that's making my brain respond this way? And if I can figure out what that is, then I can go to you and say, when I look at this, I see this and this and this and this and this, and I really like that. Do you see that as well? And you may not see that until I tell you what I'm seeing. And then once you see it, maybe you like it. And I imagine, obviously, your your experience as a DP and AC and camera operator must be very helpful in that. 
translating between the science and the art of cinematography. It, it's it's an unusually complicated technically field, but it's also often described only in like artistic terms. Yes. And what's interesting is that the people who make the products can do a spectacular job making them, but they don't always know how to describe them. And so I think it's important to kind of bridge the gap. You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting from the design side to start with a look and then engineer it into a product. You know, we have people who can do that really well, but then to go to a cinematographer and say, here's what I think you, you might see if you look at this, you know, do you, do you see this too? They don't always have the vocabulary for that. And I think as a cinematographer, you have to straddle a couple of worlds, you know, the artistic world, uh, the technical world, definitely the logistical world. It's a really unique field because you, you're trying, you're, you're hired to impart a vision to a project, but you can't do it alone. You have to wrangle a lot of different people. They all have to come together at specific times over the course of a day to make a shot happen. Uh, how well they do that often has to do with how, pro- how well prepared you are and how well you communicate what you want the result to be. And then you're also bringing that result to the table because you're working uh, with a director who has made that request of you. So it's a really interesting job where you're communicating with others, others are communicating with you, and yet you're talking about things that are very artistic and esoteric. You can't really point it at a look and say, you know, make this look. It's very difficult to communicate uh, specifics about what a cinematographer does. It, it's very difficult. And, that, and what's really hard is, especially around lenses, there is not a good vo- uh, vocabulary. For example, if you say a lens is organic, what does that mean? You know, if, if, if it's creamy, I actually asked, there were I think three people watching me test some lenses one day. And I asked them all, what, what does creamy mean? <laughs> and one said it was it was flesh tone. Another one said it was bokeh. And then someone else said it was flare quality or something like that. There's all these really nebulous words around describing lenses. And then that doesn't help either. And that's actually something I've been discussing with various people that I work with and cinematographers are in, I interact with. You know, how do we change this language so I can I can describe a characteristic to you and you understand what that is? We just don't have that right now. Right. This is the first time this has come up on this podcast, I think, but it reminds me of I was a bartender for a long time. Oh, cool. uh, Before I worked in the film industry, before I worked at Lynn Journals and uh, I worked specifically in wine bars and I had to become like not a master sommelier or anything, but a level one sommelier. So I had to learn a little bit about wine. And it's a it's a really common characteristic between like cinema lens description and wine description. (laughs) You find that, too, where you're just like. You have to struggle to find these words to describe what you're experiencing that don't really have any objective definition. So this wine has character, or this lens has character, or this is funky. It's all these words that seem like they mean something, but don't, in fact, have a quantifiable meaning. Right. Or you, or you might say, oh, this one has notes of chocolate. And, yes. uh, and someone may agree with you just because you said it. They may not necessarily, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's, it, it seems like the, there's a very similar uh, vocabulary there, or a very similar style of communicating where you're, you're trying to take sensations. And I think in the case of wine, you're trying to take sensations and break them down, even though they're very complex sensations. Right. And people may not experience them the same way from person to person. It's not definable. Right. And, and in uh, cinematography, these sensations often get translated into emotions which can make things, and sometimes sometimes it makes them a little more clear, sometimes it doesn't. And communicating with directors, I found emotions always worked. Like, does it feel like this or does it feel like that? Uh, and then you could usually get something out of them. Because if you ask specifics, like, do you want this warm or cool? Do you, what kind of contrast do you want? They can't tell you. But if you say, do you want this moody? You know, yes. Okay, well, then you try to figure out what moody means. But at least you have a direction to go. It's very difficult to put this stuff into words, but I think somebody has to do it because how else do we communicate ideas uh, other than just pointing at pictures and saying, hey, do you see that? 
And that's just not always possible. Right. And that gets into kind of the crux of what I want to talk about here, which is, well, I guess I'll start here. I used to answer phones at Lens Journals do tech support. I don't do that now, but I'm sure there are plenty of people still getting this exact question. We would get people that would call in and say, hey, I'm just getting started in videography or I'm shooting my first music video or I just graduated from film school or whatever. And I'm looking for a lens that will give me a cinematic look. I want my footage to look cinematic. And, you know, as you know, I'm sure that is a really difficult term to define. Cinematic means different things to different people. How does Ari define a cinematic look or do you think it's definable at all? When we talk about cinematic qualities, that's one of these very ethereal things. And I think it's easier to answer in regard to cameras than it is lenses, because lenses were going through a bit of a transition. In cameras, the look of our cameras is very much defined by the look of print film. Now, the trick with film is it's a a subtractive uh, process as opposed to a video monitor, which is an additive process. I'm talking about color process. In a subtractive process, you start with white light and you carve light away to leave the colors that you want. That's the way film works. You start with white light. Film is basically a filter and you carve away the portions of that spectrum that you don't want and you leave the portions that you do. Now, the result of this is If you want a really pure saturated color, it's going to be very dark because you're starting with white light and you're carving away an awful lot of that light to leave, say, like a a saturated red. You have to eliminate everything that's not a saturated red. Now, that means you're using a lot of dye to do that, which naturally blocks light. So the darkest colors are also the most saturated and the lightest colors are the least saturated. With video at least as far as looking at monitors goes, it's the opposite. You've got red, green, and blue uh, pixels, and you're basically turning those up. And if you wanted to, you could say, turn on the red pixel all the way, turn off the accompanying blue and green pixels, and get a really bright, really saturated red. You couldn't do that in film. But that's a lot of what the film look is. It's that subtractive look. And it also helps us a lot because in video, you never, you almost never clip color channels at the same time. So if I'm outdoors and I'm shooting up at the sky and for some reason I have to open up the stop to expose someone's face properly and the sky starts clipping in the blue channel, well, the blue channel will stop saturating, but the green and the red channels will keep going. So that balance is thrown off. And when you add green and red, you get yellow. So the sky starts turning yellow. And I've actually seen this happen in, uh, in early video cameras or cameras that are in development before they have the color science figured out. Uh, so this is a problem every manufacturer has to deal with. And I think because we spent a lot of time looking at how film handles highlights, we figured out how to roll off those highlights in a very beautiful filmic way. So you never see those color distortions you never feel that that weird white clip that just feels like the, the image is flattening out and it has a hard edge to it. So that's a, a big portion of what we're doing on the, on the camera side. Now, on the lens side, it's a little bit more difficult because there's an awful lot of lens aberrations that cinematographers have embraced over the last 15 to 20 years. In the past, say before the year 2000 or so, Film ruled. And the goal with film was always to make the best possible image on film that you could. And film is a very, um, I mean, it's a very analog image. It's got film grain, it has multiple layers, the layers are doing different things, and it's not a very sharp medium at all. So the goal was always to make lenses that were really sharp, especially sharp in the really coarse frequencies, to kind of punch through the, the emulsion layers and leave the best image possible. Well, when you started pairing those with digital cameras, maybe that felt a little too crisp. There's almost an aliasing effect around coarse detail that made things sound just a little bit or feel just a little bit too um, crispy or sharp or artificial. And that's when cinematographers started looking at all the older lenses that they'd sensed moved beyond (laughs) 
uh, because if you think about it, lens designers are always trying to design the best lens they can at the time. And there's a big difference between a lens that's made in the 1920s and a lens that's made in you know the 1990s. But a lot of cinematographers, uh, cinematographers felt that maybe some of these lenses made in the 1920s and 1950s paired better with digital because digital shows so much. And there was this, this move away from uh, traditional film style lenses towards the softer lenses that uh, maybe had more distortion, more spherical aberration. They felt less clean. There was a reaction to the cleanliness of the digital image, whereas film had a lot of grain and it has gate weave and there's a lot going on. Digital really didn't have that. And I think a lot of cinematographers missed that. So it's hard to say what cinematic is because a lot of the things that lens designers were trying to get away from for the first hundred years of cinema then came back for about 15 years, 15 or 20 years. Now I think we're starting to go back because what's happening is we're seeing UHD and HDR. And the better the displays get, the more you can see of what the lenses are doing. And if you're using a really funky lens, it becomes really obvious and it can become really distracting. So things like chromatic aberration that may not have been that big a deal in film, in HDR, that that color stays and it's and it's very bright. It doesn't get kind of crushed out the way you see it in HD or in film. You now have, say, if someone's standing in front of a window, they now have a bright green edge around them and that it's really distracting. So now we're kind of redefining like what is what is cinematic. I mean, to me, cinematic is always it's it's about taste. It's it's kind of a refinement. And I think we're going through a transition period now where the taste level is changing based on the fact that, you know, we were trying to bring some of that analog feel from the film days into digital. But now that that same kind of uh, vibe going forward is going to be too much. So now we're kind of, I think we're kind of backing off. That makes me think of the, um, the magnetic uh, filter holder on the signature primes that, that sort of having to walk both sides of that line to like be able to add that sort of interesting character, but to a lens that is designed for 8k or higher resolutions and hdr monitors yeah it's it's interesting because signature lenses are really designed to be beautiful and to have character but to have the kind of character that works with all these new display technologies that are coming the idea is that in five or ten or fifteen years you should be able to look at something you you shot yesterday and it will look even better in the future when you can see more of what you captured. At the same time, cinematographers are creative people. And there's this joy that comes from the happy accident that a lot of cinematographers embrace. And so we're always looking at ways to kind of help cinematographers introduce these characteristics or massage the image. And that's why we built these little magnetic holders that fit on the back. And they were originally designed for nets. And they're very well thought out. They actually, they're held on by 12 magnets. Each magnet is a click stop. So it gives you, you know, 12 different rotations. And you can align the pattern of the net with a little witness mark on the, the holder and put it on the net or put it on the lens. And there's another little witness mark. And then you can say, I want to orient this net uh, 90 degrees to the right. And I want to do it on all my lenses. Well, you can very quickly just turn each of them on all your lenses, you know, two clicks to the right and you're done. So the idea is that you can, you have an easy way to add uh, nets to the back of the lenses and also orient them consistently across the entire set. Now, why nets in the back of lenses? Well, this is an old film trick. And since we're an old film company, our product manager thought, well, why not just bring it back and make it really easy? But then we started experimenting with, well, what if we put glass back there? What if we put plastic back there? What if we put really funky things back there? And uh, we've been playing with some really interesting stuff like uh, glass diopters. Normally, you put them on the front of the the lens. Uh, If you put them on the back, you can kind of create this interesting vintage look. Uh, where the center gets a little bit softer, but then the edges get very soft and kind of streaky. 
and you get chromatic aberration at the corners of the frame, but not in the center. So you can introduce aspects of uh, what vintage lenses do. Or if you wanted to use a net, you can create a, a look that really hasn't been seen before because this is a really high performance lens with the softening agent on the back. And it's just a very different look. It's this interesting combination of new and old. All right, we'll take a quick break there and we will be right back with more from Art Adams. If you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm talking with Art Adams, Cinema Lens Specialist at Airy, and right now we're going to try to figure out what people mean when they say a lens has character. So I'm glad you use that term, character. Because it's it's a nebulous term that, like cinema or cinematic, can mean different things to different people. Uh, so to get a little bit more specific, in terms of the signature primes and in terms of bokeh specifically, uh, what are DPs typically looking for? And what aspects of lens design contribute to that aesthetic? Wow, this is a great one because I've spent a lot of time on this. And uh, it's funny, it's one of those things where when I was learning what the lenses looked like, you know, trying to teach myself what their characteristics were, I noticed the quality of the bokeh. And when I brought it up to the, the team behind the, the design of the lenses and I pointed this out, they said, well, yes, of course, they were designed that way. <laughs> Very straightforward, you know, matter of fact. Like, but But to me, it was very different from anything I'd seen before. So what I discovered in comparing a lot of different lenses is that a lot of times when people talk about bokeh, they're talking about out of focus light sources and how those are rendered. Now, that's not really what bokeh is. Bokeh is the, entire, the entirety of the out of focus image and how that's rendered. Now, the clues are hidden in those highlights because if you see what those highlights are doing, you can very quickly figure out what's happening to the rest of the image. And what I mean by that is one of the key attributes of bokeh is spherical aberration. There's two different, there, well, there's three different styles. There's uh, the perfectly even bokeh, where the highlight is even all the way across. There's the Christmas ball bokeh, or Christmas ornament, which is what my German colleagues call it, where the center is hot and then it trails off. And then you have the donut bokeh, where you have a hot outside edge and a dark center. And they all do different things to the background. Now, the Christmas ball bokeh, I think is very beautiful, but I, I've seen it very rarely. I think I've only seen one lens that's really done it well. And what's interesting is that if you have the Christmas ball bokeh on one side of the point of focus, you always have the opposite, the donut on the other side. And... It, it would be really nice to see lenses that have the, the, the hot center on the far side of the point of focus because you always have a background. You don't always have a foreground. But for some reason, the donut always ends up in the background. Now, the problem with that is if you have highlights with a hot center that bleed off and you have a whole bunch of them together, they blend really beautifully. And the background is very soft and dreamy and ethereal. If you have the donut, then each out of focus highlight becomes it basically becomes a ring and those rings compete. And what's interesting about that is even if you don't see distinct highlights, the background will have a harder feel to it because you're basically creating sort of an artificial edge around all the areas of contrast because that's what the lens is doing. Something that I've heard cinematographers talk a lot about in the past that I had not really tuned into is how quickly does a lens roll out of focus? 
And there was a DP who was testing signature primes for a TV series who said, these were all out of focus really quickly. And I thought, well, that's interesting. What does that mean? So I took a distortion chart, which is basically a four foot by eight foot chart. That's It's just a checkerboard pattern meant for uh, drawing out and making more obvious the distortions in a lens. Uh, it's used for visual effects work to create a digital map. And I shot it at an angle. I focused on the center, and then I just looked at how the checkerboard pattern went out of focus on either side of the point of focus. And I, did, I looked at this with a signature prime and then a series of other lenses kind of moving back in time, like a lens that was 10 years old, 20 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, all of which had increasing degrees of, of spherical aberration. And they all had increasing degrees of the, the donut spherical aberration with the dark center and the hot edge, because for some reason, lens designers always seem to default to that, at least on kind of wide to medium lenses. On longer lenses, they tend to go the other direction. And there's a reason for this. I don't know what it is. But what was interesting is that um, the stronger the donut bokeh on the lens, the longer that checkerboard pattern appeared to stay in focus. The structure of that checkerboard pattern uh, stayed. It, it stuck around. It was almost like uh, the depth of field was increased on the far side of the point of focus. Because if you think about it, that hot edge and dark center that you would see in a pinpoint highlight is now affecting the structure of everything in the out-of-focus image, and it just makes it feel harder. Now, signature primes don't have that. So they felt like they, they rolled out of focus very quickly by comparison because they didn't have to go very far out be before the fine details in the out-of-focus image just sort of just sort of washed away. It's a really interesting quality. I've never seen it before. And I'd imagine, you know, considering these lenses were designed for a large format sensor, that, you know, th those considerations around bokeh must have been even more important. You know, it, there's there's been a lot of talk about the large format look. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I am very curious about that because... That is another thing, another in the long line of things in this episode that is difficult to define. I can make it really simple. And I'm, I'm, I'm not always popular for doing this because I think people like the mystique uh, of the large format look because there's, there's a lot of cinematographers who will say, well, it, it allows me to, it, it makes me feel like I'm more present with the actors. I can get closer with a wider lens and the lack of distortion makes me feel like I'm right there. Well, maybe, but that really only applies to older lenses where there was a lot of distortion. If you, if you do the same thing with a, a more modern lens in Super 35, there's not that much distortion. And you can kind of do the same thing. There's, just, there's a, lot of, a lot of mystique around it. I've done a lot of testing. And what I figured out is it's all about depth of field. So if you have a Super 35 sensor and I'm framing a shot of someone, say, waist up on a 25 millimeter lens, if I keep the camera in the same spot with a large format sensor to get that same angle of view, I now need a 35 millimeter lens. Well, I've now lost half my depth of field. Now, in a close up where you're looking at someone filling a frame, we're used to the background being out of focus. And Super 35, you can very naturally uh, get close-ups to drop off and you have a lot of separation and your eye knows exactly where to look and the background kind of becomes an abstract element. Well, in a wide shot, if you can do that where someone's say waist up or knees up, it's, it's a crazy different sensation because we're just not used to that. To me, it almost feels like now the person we're looking at, the subject, is in front of a painted backdrop because I'm not used to seeing a shot that's so wide and seeing that much separation between the, the subject and the background. And that to me is 99% of it, if not all of it, is just the fact that you can frame wider shots and yet still create that very strong sense of, of uh, separation. And this is something we've seen a lot with the Alexa 65, and that's why that camera is so popular because you can you can really throw backgrounds out of focus and, uh, and, and especially in wide shots. There's a great show on, I think it's Netflix, the umbrella Academy that's shot on the Alexa 65. And they do a lot of this where they'll shoot wide shots and it almost feels like the, 
characters are cutouts in front of a, a painted backdrop. And that sounds like it should be artificial, but it's actually just strangely fascinating. Over the length of your career, how have you seen the definition of cinematic imaging change? Uh, what characteristics do you think have come maybe in and out of Vogue uh, as you've been working? You know, it's interesting because I started out in film as a camera assistant, and I think I probably moved up way too fast. If I, if I knew what I didn't know, <laughs> I never would have done it. Uh, but I, I was only a camera assistant for about five years before I started shooting. And I found that it was easier to get work in video than in film because of my age at the time. I was probably late 20s. So I would get a film job every couple months shooting second unit on a feature or shooting a commercial or something like that. And in between, I would shoot a lot of video. And I kept trying to create cinematic video. Now, one of the reasons I think a lot of people didn't think of video as being cinematic was because a lot of people shot very, very, very bright video. And I think part of that is at the time, there was no, there was no heritage in video the way there was in film. You, know, you could look at films going back 80 years and see cinematographers experimenting with carving images out of darkness. But video only if, you know, 20 years before couldn't handle that. So the, there was this, this very different mindset, you know, in a way, you know, video started out very bright and then, you know, a bunch of us were trying to push it away from that, whereas film kind of went this other direction. So to me, cinematic is really more about the tonalities in the image. It can also have something to do with the colors in an image. I like, I, I think of cinematic color as being very complex. With the appearance of, you know, relatively easy color correction, do you think lens design has changed in terms of color and contrast? You know, this is really interesting. Uh, there's a DP that we've been working with uh, for a long time, uh, Logan Schneider. Uh, he's shot a, a number of our uh, promo pieces with the Signature Primes and actually uh, with the Signature Zooms that just came out. And he had something really interesting to say about master primes and signature primes. Um, he says that when he, he uses those lenses, he has a much easier time creating looks and color correction. And I asked him what he meant by that. And it, the best we could kind of figure out is that there's a kind of clarity to those lenses that gives you more... I guess I would call it color discrimination, especially in the shadows. And what I mean by color discrimination is you can resolve more complex colors in the darker tones. So something he said in one of our behind the scenes videos that we recorded for the, um, the signature zoom uh, demo that he shot, uh, he said that a lot of lenses, when you underexpose skin, skin will turn kind of a gray color. It'll lose its color. And that seems to be related to veiling glare uh, or maybe something in, in the, the glass that, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not as clear. There's, there's elements in there that are scattering the light. And signature primes and master primes use really high quality glass. The signature primes use spectacularly high quality of glass. And we see that same thing where you can see deeper into shadows, you can see more detail, but you're also retaining more color information. And he, he just, he made the point that he was shooting a, a TV series with a, another very popular kind of lens, but it has a reputation for being low contrast, which typically means there's some veiling glare lifting up the blacks. And he was happy with the look, but he decided to switch to master primes and suddenly found this world of color correction opening up before him because he could see he had so much more control at such a deeper level and especially into the shadows. What is Ari working on right now that you're most excited about without giving away any, you know, industry <laughs> secrets or anything? Um, well, we've already announced that we're working on a new camera. I don't really have any details about it other than uh, I have seen some pictures from it, some early pictures, and it looks great. I mean, it just looks like an Ari camera. That That's kind of our thing. You know, it's uh, we've we've figured out this cinematic look, whatever that is. Uh, and we just keep carrying it forward and improving on it with 
kind of every iteration. And this that, that camera will actually be the first camera that has a completely new sensor design. Uh, oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Well, because yeah, I had it, kind of only seen like very broad rumors about this. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's going to be uh, it's going to capture UHD. Uh, I don't know what the exact resolution will be, but in a Super 35 sensor size. Now, the problem with that is to do that, you have to make the photo sites smaller. And one of the things that the company did early on was commit to large photo sites because that way you could get the signal to noise level to be as high as possible which meant we we had a very low noise floor. We had uh, the best dynamic range. And also that spills over into color because the noisier a signal is, the harder it is to make really refined color because it's almost like, you know, if you think of it like um, three-strip Technicolor, where they used to have three strips of film, one for each color record, red, green, and blue, and then they would print those together to make a, a full color image. Well, if one of those is out of focus, you're going to lose that. And that's effectively what noise is doing. If you have a noisy color channel is you're, you're basically losing resolution and focus in that color channel. And that, you know, that doesn't work for us because we're really, you know, we're all about color and dynamic range. So, and this sensor has been under development for a long time and it's only been fairly recently that they finally got it to the point where they say, we're, we're not embarrassed to put this out based on what we've done before. So that's going to be really exciting. Well, Art, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate this. This was fun. Thanks for listening to the Lunch Rentals podcast. As always, we'll link to everything we talked about here in the show notes. And Art very generously asked me to pass along his email address if anyone has any Cinema Lens questions they'd like to run by him. Art can be reached at lenses at airy.com. That's L-E-N-S-E-S at A-R-R-I dot com. The Lens Rentals podcast is a production of lensrentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at lensrentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sokala will leave you with an inspirational quote. Never have a battle of wits with an unarmed person. Mark Twain.